Kelton McMahon. Um, he's, uh, he did his PhD at the um, Woods Hole MIT Joint Program, finished it in 2011, then went and did a short stint in DC, uh, Santa Cruz, and has been at uh, University of Rhode Island in the uh, School of Oceanography for the last five and a half years. Um, so in coral reef ecology, there's this sort of big question about where does energy come from to make these systems so productive? And the reason why I uh, became aware of his work is he did some really early super cutting edge work sort of revolutionizing how we can even think about it, quantify it, and actually giving us some real numbers to chew on. Like, and that's really changed a lot of people's perspectives on how we think about energy flow in these systems, which is what I think about all the time. I think it's really fascinating. But as I've gotten to know him better, I've learned he's very diverse in his thinking. So not only does he have this uh, really awesome methodological toolkit, but he also thinks really broadly about multiple different systems. And that can range from um, thinking about equity in science, particularly thinking about decolonizing science, in particular um, integrating indigenous knowledge with biogeochemistry to improve fisheries sustainability, which is pretty awesome, uh, as well as thinking about paleo food webs um, and the dynamics in Antarctic krill predators, and um, among other things, the, the whole marine biology pump in the ocean, which is just a small thing to tackle. Um, and um, so, but I'm really excited to have him here. I'm really looking forward to the talk. It's been a bit fun visit so far. And with that, I will let Kelvin. Sweet. Thanks, yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, there are lots of, I actually, I put together a new talk, so we'll see, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff I've, you know, already published, uh, but sort of two thirds is going to be stuff I haven't published yet. So, um, which I always find fun. Uh, but yeah, in general, uh, I'm I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I've had a full day. It actually kind of felt like a faculty interview, like meeting <laughs> 30 minutes with a huge array of people, and it's been awesome uh, sharing stories. And and I, I'm excited to talk a little bit about some of the work my lab does, if that changes, yep. Uh, I've got an awesome lab of people at URI. Uh, I'm actually probably one of the only isotope people, like, you know, full on isotope people in my lab. I've got engineers, I've got social scientists, uh, I have policy makers. Uh, and together, we've done a lot of really cool work thinking about how people, climate, human environment interactions shape marine food webs and how those changes feed back to influence goods and services marine systems provide to people. Uh, and we do this across a, a huge range of systems around the world, as well as lots of different time scales from modern stuff to cool paleo applications. Uh, in general, uh, as a group, I think we're pretty obsessed with food. Uh, I've been obsessed with the concept of food my entire life, and so it's pretty apropos that I decided to make a career out of that. Um, I think food's a really powerful lens in which to think about how the world works. You know, ranging from the controls it plays on individual growth uh, and survival. Uh, this is my, at that point, one-year-old, Willow, uh, last year at Thanksgiving, eating a turkey drumstick the size of her head. <laughs> to the controls it plays on the ecological or evolutionary trajectory of populations, you know, all the way up to some ecosystem scale structuring like biogeochemical cycling or controls on things like biodiversity, you know, all the way up to the controls that food has on social and cultural fabric of society. You know, when you meet somebody, what do you do? You invite them into your house for tea. When you want to celebrate the life or the death of somebody. You have a feast, you have a festival. So food, I think, shapes everything from individual to ecosystem to entire cultural scale. So I think if you can understand something about how food, how energy moves through a system, you can learn a lot about how that system was built, how it functions, how resilient or adaptive it might be. Uh, and so. My group tends to tackle questions about food using isotopes uh, as a powerful tool for thinking about how energy moves through systems. You know, uh, isotopes being uh, an intrinsic marker of energy flow of organic matter as it moves through a system. You know, if you look at the heavy to light uh, ratio of different <coughs> elements, uh, you can get 
a powerful metric of how biological, chemical, physical processes alter the flow of food through a system. Uh, people have been using isotopes for you know, almost a century now to think about food web dynamics. Uh, classically, the bulk isotope approach uh, would be you go out and you catch a sample. Maybe you catch a nice yellowfin tuna. You obviously need to take a little bit of that for yourself for some quality control assurance. The rest of it, you dry, you package up in a little tin capsule, you drop it into an elemental analyzer, into a furnace, and it burns up. And it turns all of that carbon into CO2, all that nitrogen into N2. And you effectively turned that tuna into a single value. And that value can tell you something about that tuna, where it lived, what it did. Uh, but it's a, a integrative signal of a lot of complexity. And so I liken this bulk approach to the way I go wine tasting. Uh, this is my wife and I uh, on our honeymoon in the Azores here uh, drinking amazing wine. Uh, when I drink wine, I swirl it around and I take a sip and I proudly proclaim like, this is wine, like it's good wine. And that's important. It tells me something about where I am and what I'm doing. But I miss a lot of important intricacies about that wine in my very distilling approach of like, yep, that's white wine, I think. My wife, on the other hand, takes a much more molecular approach to wine. She has a far more refined palate than I do. And she can tell you things about that wine. You know, oh, I'm picking up notes of oyster shell and you know, stone fruit. She can tell you about the terroir based on the tannins in that wine, the climate, what year that wine came from based on the growing conditions that she knows about for that region. So she pulls apart all of this complexity by looking at the individual compounds, the individual makeup of that composition. And so that's the power that you can get by rather than taking this bulk approach, what if we actually isolate individual compounds out of a sample and look at the intricate metabolic histories that each of these compounds has as they are acquired, modified, allocated in an organism? And so in this seminar, I'm going to sort of walk through a couple of different case studies of our approach to thinking about how you can look at this sort of atomic scale that went into building molecular structures like individual amino acids. And how can you use that to scale up for questions about organismal ecology or even entire ecosystem dynamics? And so I'm going to touch on a couple of different projects we've worked on. Uh, thinking about food web architecture and the role that plays in structuring biodiversity on coral reefs. Looking at movement ecology, and in particular thinking about how understanding connectivity and functional connectivity in a system can help us with applied questions like designing marine protected areas. And then finally, some of the work I'm really interested in now, which is thinking about these systems as truly coupled socio-environmental systems, and how do we put local place-based knowledge at the forefront of research to both enhance research capacity, but also develop research that truly focuses on the goals of the communities most vulnerable to the environmental change we're seeing today. So I'm going to do a lot of this today's talk on coral reefs, um, which is one of the primary focal areas of my work. Coral reefs are these incredibly biodiverse systems in this paradoxically nutrient poor environment. And so understanding food and how different organisms have made their lives foraging in this oligotrophic nutrient poor system has been a fascinating question for scientists for hundreds of years. Uh, and I think you know, this video like, highlights just some of the amazing diversity in approaches that organisms use to acquire resources in this incredibly nutrient poor system. You know, and this sort of biodiversity has led to some really paradigm questions in ecology. Like Hutchinson has asked, like, how are there so many species? 
And so we asked the questions like this, um, in this case in the Red Sea, uh, thinking about these three different sister species of snapper. Uh, they're like absolutely best friends. That you find them together all the time. They school together. They appear to forage together. They look incredibly similar. Like some of them just look like a, a faded picture version of their, you know, uh, congeneric species. If you think about like, so here's a system that should be ripe for competition. Why do we have these species coexisting that functionally seem really similar? If you uh, you know, if you frame it in the context of competitive exclusion, which has its own challenges as an ecological theory, you'd say like, you know, what is allowing them to coexist either in time, in space, in resource use? They school together, they appear to forage together. If you look at their stomach contents, they all look like mushed up, you know, decapod crustaceans and maybe some little fish. So. What is it about this system that allows them to coexist? And we had some questions about whether foraging ecology might play a role in their coexistence. And so we used isotopes as an intrinsic metric of thinking about how energy flows through these systems. Here I'm showing bulk nitrogen isotope value on the y-axis. We have our Ehrenberg snapper on the left in orange, Lucianus fulviflama, this black spot snapper in magenta in the middle, and Casmira, which is a blue line snapper on the right. Here I've got the nitrogen isotope values. Uh, this is again bulk, so we just took some muscle tissue, packaged it up, dropped it in a furnace, looked at the nitrogen isotope value of all the nitrogen in that tissue. And we saw some interesting patterns. In particular, Casmira had a much lower nitrogen isotope value than those other two species. And they're like, ah, if you know something about isotope theory, you might suggest maybe they're feeding at different trophic positions. So perhaps Casmira is actually feeding at a lower trophic position than either Ehrenberg snapper or Fulviflama. The challenge with this sort of bulk isotope approach is that the isotope value of a consumer reflects not only the trophic position, so where it is in the food chain, but it also reflects the isotope value at the base of the food web. And it can be really challenging to tease apart whether the differences in nitrogen isotope value of these different um, populations of fish are because they're feeding in different trophic positions, or maybe they're all at the same trophic position, but they're feeding in isotopically distinct food webs. In a coral reef system, you know, that might be coral-based um, production or microbially reworked detritus or macroalgae or phytoplankton. And so you would have to go in and a priori characterize the baseline of these upper trophic level consumers in order to scale our model of trophic position. And that's actually pretty challenging, uh, especially in a complex ecosystem like this or in a paleo context where it may not even be possible to reconstruct what that isotope baseline is hundreds or thousands of years ago. And so compound specific stable isotope analysis has been a really powerful tool to get at teasing apart the relative importance of baseline biogeochemical cycling variability and trophic dynamics for controlling the isotope dynamics of consumers. So here's an example uh, from a colleague of mine uh, looking at the food web in a coastal marine system. Uh, on the x-axis, we've got a, a general food web. So we've got some macroalgae on the left, gastropods, some crabs, some fish. We have bulk nitrogen isotope value on the y-axis. <coughs> Here we have the bulk nitrogen isotope value, and it generally increases as you go up your food chain, which is a pretty classic phenomenon in isotope ecology. Uh, but it turns out that if you look at the individual amino acids that make up that bulk tissue, you see a starkly contrasting pattern across these trophic transfers. So there's actually some amino acids, for example, phenylalanine, that change very little in nitrogen isotope value from diet to consumer. So during a trophic transfer, there's very little change in nitrogen isotope value. So as you move up your food web from your primary producers to your snails, to your crabs, to your fish, the isotope value reflects that baseline nitrogen isotope signal in our fish. At the same time, there's a set of amino acids that we call trophic amino acids 
that actually undergo a lot of trophic fractionation. So they change nitrogen isotope value quite a bit during each trophic transfer. And so here now, you have two different metrics, a baseline biogeochemical cycling metric and a trophic dynamic metric intrinsically recorded in the tissue of your consumer. And so you can actually look at the offset between your heavily fractionating you know, trophic amino acid and that baseline biogeochemical cycling signal. And you can calculate a trophic position that's internally indexed to variation in the baseline. So I no longer have to make guesses about what the baseline of my fish is, go out, collect that, measure it. That's actually recorded in the tissues, in the molecular uh, makeup of my consumer that we can tease apart by looking at individual amino acids rather than burning all of that fish up into one isotope value and averaging across all of this metabolic complexity. So you can imagine in a, in a hypothetical scenario, we've got fish A on the left, fish B on the right. Here's our nitrogen isotope value. They have different isotope, they have different isotope values. If that offset was because these two fish were feeding at different trophic positions, we'd expect their source amino acids, minimally fractionating amino acids like phenylalanine, to be quite similar, but the offset between their trophic and source amino acids to be different. So that is a trophic position signal that's reflected in this bulk isotope value. Conversely, if they are two fish feeding on the same, in the same trophic level, but in two isotopically distinct food webs, you'd expect the offset between our trophic and source amino acids to be similar, but the source amino acids are quite different. So now you're in a two biogeochemically distinct systems. And so we can do that with our snapper. So here's our, that bulk isotope data again. Our original hypothesis was just that, that Chasmera maybe is feeding lower in the food web, and maybe that's one of the ways that it's not directly competing with its congeneric species. Here I'm plotting the nitrogen isotope values of those trophic amino acids, in this case glutamic acid, up here in red, and our source, our baseline amino acids in blue. We can plug it into a trophic position equation that intrinsically or internally uh, reflects whatever variation in baseline that fish is experiencing. We can turn that into a trophic position equation, and our hypothesis certainly was dead. Um, these tr amino, you know, amino acid isotope data show that all of these fish are actually feeding at the same trophic position. So that variation in nitrogen isotope value is actually a record of variation in isotope value at the base of the food web. And so this is really intriguing because these fish school together. Uh, like you basically rarely ever find them apart. And so how are they feeding in isotopically distinct food webs? you know, clearly at the same trophic position. And so then this got us thinking about like, okay, like how do you even source carbon in a complex reef system? Where are these consumers getting their food from? You know, and so this is uh, one of the reasons that my friends and family all think I have vacation for a living. This is one of my beautiful field sites. Uh, and you know, it's set, the, all of this biodiversity is set on the backdrop of this like absolutely crystal clear blue water. So super oligotrophic, very low nutrient. And so thinking about where food comes from, where do nutrients come from in the system, you know, it could be water column production. Uh, there's a classic wall of mouths hypothesis, the idea that reefs are just these absolutely voracious walls of consumption that any nutrients that come through from the outside in get snapped up instantly. Maybe it's actually reef-derived new production, so whether that's through symbioses like in coral or reef-derived macroalgae, or maybe it's actually a brown food web. Maybe this is uh, recycling, and so they don't actually need a lot of, you know, um, a lot thinnest nutrient input because they're so efficient at recycling through microbial food webs. And so thinking about how these different sort of primary carbon sources fuel food webs and fuel the food web architecture of a coral reef. Isotopes are really helpful for that. People have been using isotopes for you know, almost 100 years to do this sort of question. The challenge in a coral reef is that many of our very ecologically distinct end members, like macroalgae or coral or detritus, 
are isotopically quite similar. So it's actually hard to tease apart, you know, whether you're getting pro production from macroalgae or coral, even if ecologically, those two things say very different things about the health of a reef or the ecological sort of trajectory of the reef. So understanding whether your, you know, your consumers rely on macroalgae or coral or a brown recycled food web is really important for making predictions about health and resilience of those reefs going forward. Well, it turns out that uh, there's actually tremendous metabolic diversity in the ways that primary producers make individual amino acids. So it often takes you know, anywhere from five to 15 or more independent enzymatic steps to make an amino acid. And there's actually a lot of uh, metabolic diversity in those individual synthesis pathways that lead to common end product amino acids. And each of those enzymatic chains imparts different isotopic fractionation on those intermediaries. So by the time you get to the end, your target amino acid, there are very different isotope values depending on who made that organic matter. So here I'm plotting uh, the results of a principal component analysis where we looked at the individual carbon isotope value of a suite of five different essential amino acids from each of our sort of four target primary producer end members. So we've got our phytoplankton in blue, macroalgae in green, coral is in magenta, and then that microbially reprocessed detritus, which is a sort of nebulous end member uh, that we can talk about later if you want in brown. And while there was a lot of overlap in their sort of bulk isotope value, you know, you just take a chunk of macroalgae and you dry it and you drop it in a furnace. If you actually look at the individual amino acids, there's actually a lot of metabolic diversity in how they make those amino acids, which separates out really nice in multivariate isotope space and effectively creates an isotopic fingerprint of who made that organic matter. And by targeting essential amino acids, so those are the ones that uh, algae, plants, bacteria can all make themselves, but most metazoans have lost the enzymatic capacity to make, at least to make in quantities sufficient for normal growth. Most of our essential amino acids, we have to get directly from our diet. And so there's very little isotopic fractionation of essential amino acids as you go from diet to consumer. So the isotope fingerprints that you develop at the base of the food web are effectively passed on unmodified up a food chain. This is uh, some controlled feeding experiment work here. I've got a bunch of different amino essential amino acids on the x-axis, the carbon isotope fr trophic fractionation. So how much does that amino acid change its isotope value from diet to consumer? And you see, there's very little change from diet to consumer. So these fingerprints are, end up getting passed on to your consumers. And so you can actually go and look at the essential amino acid carbon isotope value of a fish. Like here, in this case, this is an obligate coral feeding butterfly fish um, that gets almost all, basically all of its carbon from eating coral. You can plot the essential amino acid carbon isotope values in this multivariate space. And you see that it nicely falls on this sort of continuum right around coral, maybe getting pulled a little bit towards detritus. Not surprising, you know, um, these corals tend to be sort of a, a holobiont consortium of microbes and coral and their symbionts. And so here's this really nice tool that allows us to sort of reconstruct the relative contribution of different end members to the production supporting an upper, upper trophic level consumer like our fish. Uh, and you can plug that into something like a Bayesian isotope mixing model. And you can actually start to reconstruct food web architecture in a way that we can't in that sort of classic bulk isotope approach. So we did that for our three uh, co-schooling snapper. And honestly, the results of this like just blew my mind uh, to the point where I was like, I fucked this up. Like, I definitely did something wrong. Like, there's no way you get compartmentalization like this. So our Ehrenberg snapper, so here what I'm showing is relative contribution of our four end members. So phytoplankton in blue, macroalgae in green, coral in magenta, detritus in brown. Uh, so relative contribution on the y-axis. And each of these uh, bars is an individual fish uh, that we collected. Is, um, and 
what we see is that Ehrenberg snapper get you know, the vast majority of their carbon from a macroalgal-based food web. Ehrenberg uh, fulviflama gets a lot of its carbon from macroalgae, and Casimera gets like almost all, so over like nearly 80% of its carbon from a water column phytoplankton-based production. So here we have these sister species that are schooling together, that are clearly feeding on little decapod crustaceans and little shrimps and you know, maybe some little fish, but they're doing something fundamentally different in this system in a way that we would, had not been able to get to with you know, st typical traditional stomach content analysis or bulk isotope value. And so you know, we propose that this may have some important implications for thinking about coexistence in nutrient limiting systems like a coral reef. And when I first did this, I was like, okay, that something went wrong. So we did it with other species. Then we did it with other systems. And we keep getting this pattern. And it's not always the case. Uh, we looked at things like uh, giant moray eels. And they look like, if you did a, a fish survey, they look like the, you know, the isotope signal in a moray eel. It looks like they just pick off whatever fits in their mouth that swims by their little hidey hole. So there are certainly species that can act as a true generalist that's just eating whatever goes by. But man, there are a bunch of species in here that don't. And you have to remember that these, are, these species are you know, trophic level three or four. So they're not feeding on macroalgae and coral and, and phytoplankton, but they are feeding on a really siloed energy flow. So to get this sort of compartmentalization, their diet also has to be channeling a really reduced resource utilization pool. And so this has opened up a whole host of new questions about like, how the hell do you actually do this? Like, how does this work? But it happened so many times in so many systems that there's, there's like, you know, this, it has to be a fundamentally structuring force in these coral reefs. And so these sorts of fundamental questions about how energy moves through a coral reef have like opened up all sorts of new windows, new, you know, into some really exciting and much more applied work. Uh, for example, can you use these variations in carbon flow pathways in a system to look at questions like functional connectivity, the movement of organisms across heterogeneous seascapes, like in the case of ontogenetic movement of this Ehrenberg snapper from coastal wetlands like mangroves and seagrass beds that they often use as juvenile nursery habitats out to offshore fisheries where they become integrated into coastal subsistence fishing. And so, if you look at an archival tissue like an otolith that actually records isotopic information about where a fish was living and what it was feeding on throughout its life, you can actually get a chronological record of resource utilization patterns in time and space using this molecular isotope approach. And so we did just that. Um, in this case, uh, in the coast of Saudi Arabia, uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, uh, has been actively working for, for all the challenge, you know, challenges we have with working in Saudi Arabia. Uh, one of the really impactful parts uh, that we've done scientifically is thinking about how you design effective spatial management in the context of these coupled, coupled socio-environmental systems. Like, Saudi really wants to protect offshore fisheries, but they're also really interested in developing coastal aquaculture, particularly prawn farms. And so they have questions about, you know, what is the role of coastal wetlands, mangroves and seagrass beds, as nursery habitats for offshore fisheries? And how do you effectively manage multi-use function in a coastal environment like this? And so we set out to ask some of these questions. Um, in this case, uh, that little star is Ali from the Red Sea. Uh, and we wanted to look at connectivity ontogenetically through lifetime of the snapper, which is a really important um, fishery target in uh, coastal Saudi Arabia, and thinking about the role that these coastal wetlands play as nursery habitats for offshore reefs. And so we went out and uh, 
characterize the sort of isotopic fingerprints of these habitats uh, based on the sort of unique food web structure in coastal wetlands like mangroves or seagrass beds versus patch reefs versus offshore reefs uh, in multivariate isotope space. So again, we're using the multivariate carbon isotope value of multiple different essential amino acids collected from juvenile fish at all of these potential sort of um, habitats. So here, this is uh, a linear discriminant function analysis. Um, in this case, because we did not want to a priori categorize our system, we wanted to sort of plug in all the isotope values of all the fish we got and look at how that fell out in multivariate space. And we saw like really nice separation again based on the food web principles I talked about in that first example manifesting as geospatial variation. Coastal wetlands here in green, even you know, separate from coastal reefs, which might only be you know, a kilometer or so apart, but isotopically, they're incredibly distinct. Uh, this island, which is called Avalot, um, was made famous in the memoirs of Jacques Cousteau. So there's a little bit of sentimental value in, in thinking about connectivity through these systems. And then um, these reefs, like Sout and Brown Reef, are right at the, at the um, continental shelf break. And so uh, these oceanic reefs are actually off the shelf in like surrounded by deep ocean water uh, and are like these gorgeous like pinnacle reef systems. So very, very different from um, these uh, like, sh you know, shallow, like, you know, 25 to 50 meter reef systems. And so we went out and then collected adults in the fisheries in these various offshore reefs. So two kilometers offshore in these little patch reefs, 10 and 20 kilometers offshore on these shelf reefs, and then 40 kilometers off the shelf break out in these like oceanic you know, pinnacle waters. We isolated the juvenile core of these adult fish. So this is the time frame when those fish were a juvenile. And then we used like a maximum likelihood estimator to match up the essential amino acid carbon isotope fingerprints in the core of these otoliths back to these potential nursery habitats to look at where were these offshore adults spending their juvenile nursery period. Uh, and so here I'm showing the results of some of those models. Uh, in each of these, this is going to be distance offshore. So these are the results for uh, adults from 2 kilometers, 10, 20, and 40. On the x-axis, I have the five potential nursery habitats, so coastal wetlands on the left, making our way offshore to oceanic reefs. Uh, and then this is just relative contribution of that adult population. And so I don't have time to like dig into all of the details of this, but what we found is some really fascinating patterns about the importance of these iconic coastal wetlands as nursery habitats for offshore fisheries. Uh, in particular, we noticed that, you know, especially near these reefs, so these coastal reefs and, and shelf reefs, you know, a significant portion of those fish actually did spend their nursery periods, you know, that first year or so of life in those coastal wetlands. But as you move offshore, the importance decreases. Uh, Abu Lot ended up becoming a really important nursery habitat for a lot of fish out on that sort of shelf break. And then if you go all the way offshore, you don't even see a hint of those um, coastal wetland nurseries anymore. But fascinating enough, you actually do see some not insignificant contribution of fish spending a nursery period. So they live out here on this oceanic reef, but they spent their juvenile nursery period on this shelf island system. And that means those fish had to travel through what is typically considered a hard migration barrier of deep open water to get to these offshore reefs. Uh, in subsequent uh, years since this paper was published, uh, we convinced uh, one of the princes who owns an underwater submersible to let us go and tool around. And there's actually these underwater fins that uh, are you know, be well below the, the depth of, um, of even, I, I have a rebreather dive certification. So I you know, routinely go down to about 100 meters, so well below this. But there are actually these fins that connect some of these oceanic reefs. And so we actually think there may be migration corridors that 
uh, these fish are using to link offshore. But so they're making these pretty massive migrations. Even, you know, you see signals of these coastal wetlands out here at 20 kilometers offshore. So it's a pretty incredible connectivity through this complex seascape. And it plays a pretty important role in thinking about the structure and function of these uh, offshore fisheries. So if you look at the relative contribution of coastal wetlands with distance, not too super surprising. There's a, there's a pretty steep drop off. But you also see that mirrored in adult uh, density as you move offshore. And so thinking about how you structure or manage fisheries and the importance of coastal wetlands, you need to think about connectivity. And so we've been using these data to help think about how you design effective networked spatial management. Like, do, should we be protecting wetlands and offshore reefs? Should we be thinking about migration corridors? And how can we use isotopic tools to look at migration where, you know, typical like telemetry, you try to put a little acoustic tag on a juvenile snapper, one, it's gonna sink to the bottom like a rock. So I can, I can guarantee I can tell you where it's gonna be but it's not gonna be a very realistic picture of movement ecology. And two, there's so, so much production in this system that there's no way you're ever gonna be able to track movement. There's, you know, genetics isn't gonna work in the system. It's a really well mixed system. So isotopes ended up being a really powerful tool for thinking about movement ecology in the context of, of spatial management. And so we produced a whole bunch of great papers from this, some high profile papers but I would be remiss to not think about the makeup of the community that contributed to this science. So here I, are the photos of all of my co-authors um, on all of this research that I did. Um, this is all stuff I did for my PhD. And it's a whole bunch of fantastic people that were instrumental in my development, but it's also a whole bunch of people that look just like me that came from universities and institutions that look just like mine. And I think there's a real disservice to siloing energy, like communication and science through these limited knowledge pathways. And so this isn't because I didn't care about or think about the communities that are directly impacted by this work. You know, I, I put in a lot of concerted effort into trying to tap into local community knowledge, working with local fishers, working with the fisheries community to understand what habitats are important, uh, incorporating knowledge into our movement models about where you find and don't find juveniles. But none of that made it into the co-authorship of these papers, and I think that's such a missed opportunity, both in terms of centering the goals and priorities of these communities in the work we're doing, but also in the actual science we produce. When you decouple the knowledge from the place in which it was built, you lose a lot of information. And so <laughs> it's always hard to talk about this part because you know it's like here's my like my you know the what not to do in science like. Um, but I think reflecting on some of the, my approaches when I first got into science and how I can do a better job to communicate the goals and values of the communities that I work in is going to mutually benefit both those communities but also the science we produce. And so I want to transition into how I sort of frame my science now, which is thinking about truly coupled socio-environmental systems. You cannot decouple science from the people that do that science, and you cannot decouple either of those processes from the communities that are impacted by that science. You know, we often like to think of science as this objective pursuit of knowledge where it doesn't matter who did it. Like, you know, your data are your data. It's, you know, and that's the beauty of science. It doesn't matter who of us did it, it's reproducible. But that's not really true. Our, our personal experience, our implicit bias, fundamentally shapes what questions we ask, how we interpret our data, where we study, and why we study. And so I think uh, 
thinking about diverse ecosystems and the diverse people that are connected to it is critical to developing actually impactful use-inspired research. And so a, a large portion of my work now uh, thinks about how we can actually couple place-based or community knowledge, working with indigenous communities to develop truly collaborative partnerships for shaping uh, research in marine conservation, spatial planning, and, and fundamental basic research as well. And so this is actually some work that we've been doing in Micronesia, thinking about how we can look at relationships between changing uh, fishing culture and technology, changes in sociocultural dynamics and governance, and ecosystem integrity. So how do changes in communities impact the environment, and how do the those changes in the environment feed back to influence the goods and services reefs provide to people. Uh, so this work takes place in Ulithi. This is actually the fourth largest atoll in the world. Uh, it's in Yap, uh, which is in the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, this is a pretty incredible system to work in. Uh, there are about a thousand people that live on Ulithi Atoll. Uh, there's no electrical grid system. Uh, it's a very traditionally governed system. They actually have their own um, uh, autonomous sovereign constitution written into the overarching uh, constitution of the Federated States of Micronesia, which gives them uh, a sovereignty over the management of that atoll system. Uh, they get about, I, I think, almost all of their protein from reef systems and nearly half of their calories. So this is a fundamentally coupled socio-environmental system. Uh, and we, my, me and colleagues, were doing work in some surrounding systems, in, uh, particularly in the Solomons. Uh, and uh, we were contacted by community members in Ulithi and invited in to talk about some of the changes they, they're experiencing in the reef system, uh, particularly noticing declines in both coral health uh, and associated declines in fish catch. And so we came in to sort of talk about what might be driving these changes and how we might be able to help integrate some of our understanding of reef systems, particularly using uh, some of the analytical tool sets that we have with the place-based community knowledge that they've used to successfully govern and manage their reef systems for thousands of years. This community of co-authors and co-PIs on proposals looks very different than the community that I had built in you know, my PhD. But it's a community that it much more accurately reflects the integrated knowledge exchange that this type of partnership, I think, needs to be successful. You know, uh, we have a NSF proposal in right now um, in review that has members of Ulithi as co-PIs on that proposal. And we did that actually by developing uh, a nonprofit, uh, which allowed community members to get um, NSF IDs and be true, full, integrated collaborators, um, rather than where community members often go, which is as an unnamed like participant support you know, metric in our budget, right? And this is really, really important because this is a community that still has the footprints of colonialism all over it. Ulithi was a major staging area for the US in World War II. Um, in fact, the airport, the airstrip that we use uh, to come into Ulithi uh, was laid down in World War II. Uh, these were the barracks. This is on Mogmog, which is actually the spiritual center of this atoll system that was clear cut for an R&R &R center for the US troops. Here you can see a traditional outrigger canoe with um, destroyers in the background in, in that lagoon. And so it was really, really important for us to think about how we center the needs, priority, and voice of this community in the research we're doing. Because this is an incredibly important place for answering some really important fundamental questions about the structure, the function, the resilience of coral reef systems, for asking questions about coupled human environmental systems, but it can't be a place that, that is exploited for that knowledge. 
Some of the work that we were asked to do uh, revolved around changes in fishing technology and how that might be influencing the health of these coral reef systems. We uh, have been looking at changes in traditional um, fishing community-based uh, practices. You know, there are about 78 different types of fishing that the community has historically used. Uh, in recent years, um, particularly with the development of spearfishing that came in through Hawaii and motorized boats, it's down to like maybe four or five. And spear guns are by far the vast majority of, uh, of fisheries collection. And so we're asking questions about how previously really strongly coupled feedback systems between sociocultural and governance systems and coral reef health may be interrupted by interjecting a tool system without the associated governance or knowledge. So there is a potential mismatch when you introduce spear guns from Hawaii, but you don't bring in that cultural system. Spear guns are a very individualized fishing approach into a community whose governance is based on communal engagement. And so how might these mechanistic sort of drivers create mismatches or feedbacks between sociocultural systems and food web systems? And so through this nonprofit that we've developed, you know, we ask social science, natural science, and trad traditional management questions uh, across a whole range of different topics. A lot of this has to do with listening. And I've talked to a number of you, particularly the grad students, about you know, some of the challenges of this sort of work. Like, you know, I spent five plus years building relationships where I didn't publish a single thing out of this work. And so being able to do this comes from a place of privilege in that I've got a lab with other grants and other projects so that you know, my dean isn't mad at me for spending five years not publishing something. So there's some real privilege that goes into building a, a relationship like this, but the impact is absolutely incredible. And so, you know, we built a system of communication, of trust, and that then allowed us to ask questions that sort of center that community need in a really applied way. So, you know, one of the first things we did was just do surveys of community concern to understand what's really important, you know? And management, fishing, and cultural practice were really, really important in this system. You know, we did surveys like looking at fish biomass, you know, inhabited and uninhabited, you know, and some very classic patterns emerge, right? When you're in inhabited systems, both biomass, but also the bio, you know, the, uh, the functional roles of those organisms shift, right? You know, everybody likes to eat predators, anaerobic herbivores, we looked at community dynamics. We've actually created a, a, a really important community science uh, initiative where we bring in technology and empower those local communities to be able to do that work themselves so that they no longer need us, so that when our funding runs out or our interest or whatever it might be, we don't take that knowledge with us, but we leave it with that community. You know, looking at things like catch how you know how are fish caught what types of fish if you look at the top five species caught they're all all caught by spear fishing and they're all herbivorous so what role might that play in the health of those systems we do things like the looking at the uh these isotope techniques to show that not all roaming herbivores are functionally equivalent some of them rely much more heavily on macroalgae and some are on detritus and so the ecological impacts of fishing one versus the other are very, very different. And so we can use these analytical tool sets to help inform decisions about fishing, you know, fishing targets. This system is set up uh, in these fishing jurisdictions where um, these are all clan-based fishing jurisdictions. And so each of them has their unique skill sets. You know, we've got octopus fishers and we've got, you know, tuna fishers and snapper fishers. But uh, our group, not me in particular, I don't do any population genetics, so I couldn't even tell you what the hell that says. But somebody else tells me that it shows that there's a lot of connectivity in this system. And so we're actually able to use population genetics to show that fish populations are actually really well connected across 
these Atoll systems. And so within six months of showing them and these data and talking to them about this, they developed an inter-clan council to manage, think about managing fisheries across these island communities. So rather than everybody doing their own thing in their own silo jurisdiction, they now created an inter-clan council to help exchange information about fishing practice. So we will never come into this, I'm wrapping up, uh, we will never come into this you know, and tell people what they should do. But through a partnership like this, we can provide scientific support to integrate this sort of knowledge into a local ecosystem-based management approach. Uh, you know, and I think it's really, really important to think about how you center the community needs, their voices, their approaches, and their knowledge into this research as equal information rather than purely just like broader impacts. You know, as these communities are increasingly put on the cutting edge of environmental challenge like climate change, their voices are also equally getting muted out in this process. And so uh, I like to end with this quote um, by Mao Payolag, uh, who's a master navigator um, in Micronesia, who said, my grandfathers tell me not to hold knowledge to myself. I have to pass it on. Before some navigators in Micronesia, they never share that knowledge. But me, I share it to everybody, because I know someday we may lose it. This idea that building communication bridges across across disciplines, across communities, I think has been fundamental in shifting how I think about fundamental science and applied science and pulling them all together. So uh, there's been a whole bunch of uh, groups that have really helped fund and support this work. Uh, so I'll put that up there while I take some questions. Uh, but I, I thank you all for your, uh, your time, your energy. This is the first time I ever gave this talk, so it's not too bad, I think. Uh, a little longer than I was expecting, but I, uh, I'm excited to be able to share a bunch of this stuff that I haven't published yet and I haven't even actually got to talk about yet. So thank you for being my audience for that trial. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Uh, so the Back to the isotopes, the uh, amino acid thing seems pretty cool if you know where the fish is, like where it lives. But for the movement part, like what's the turnover in tissue composition? Do you, like, do you know, what, what do you know, know about that? Because like for <coughs> bird migration research, that hasn't really yeah. used isotopes for some things, but I've never seen that before. And I'm just wondering how long it takes before you lose the geographic signature. So it depends on what you're looking at. Um, so in, you know, so lots of different tissues, lots of different turnover rates. In otoliths, they're incrementally grown. So your resolution is just whatever your, whatever your analytical limitation is. So as our instruments get more and more sensitive, we need less and less material. Uh, <coughs> in birds, so it depends, are you gonna look at, you know, are you gonna do a blood draw? You know, well, I mean, are you I gonna mean, do right, a well, feather? Like, I don't you know, think this has been I, yeah, I'm just curious, like what? Yeah. You even for the fish, like if it, do you have a baseline expectation? Or yeah. Is it so, if I'm looking at something like, you know, if if I don't mind sacrificing the organism, you know, like a fish, and I'm looking at its liver, that's going to be an integrated signal over like you know a couple of weeks. Muscle might be a couple of months. Bone might be a couple of years. Uh, with feather, um, like so, you know, I do a lot of work with penguins. Uh, and feathers are really nice because they, they um, are deposited in, uh, you know, in uh, abandoned colonies. And so we, we actually do a lot of paleontological excavations and pull out feathers and eggshells from thousands of years ago. Uh, and, you know, that's going to be an integrated signal typically right, you know, right before molt. And so um, you can actually, you know, especially if you catch a penguin while it's molting, you can actually get the new feather system and the old feather system. Uh, Eggshell is about the two weeks before they lay their eggs. Uh, bone, so you often get bone in the same you know, uh, archive pile that you did your feathers or your eggshell. Might be a year of integration. And so in some ways, 
so sometimes that pose is a challenge, but sometimes it's actually really powerful because you can actually get an, a sort of isotopic clock, right? So if you look at multiple tissues, you can get different windows of what they've been doing through their lives. Uh, we do a lot of that work thinking about questions of like how reproductive stress in, you know, influences metabolism. And so you can, you can look at breath, which is like hours, and then you can take blood draw, and then you can take a feather, and then you can get multiple time series from that single bird at that single time point. Excellent. Other questions? I don't know if there's anything in the chat either. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a really fun talk. That was super interesting. I have a question about, so in the, uh, the snapper example, you showed that there was you know, pretty strong um, you know, niche differentiation. Uh, I was really curious when you showed that stacked bar plot with the daisy mixture model, there were, it looked like there were some individuals within each species. There was like a characteristic species flavor, but some of them were deviating from that. Did yeah. You, did you have any data on like body condition from those individuals? Were they like, you know, scrawny or were they killing it? Or was there, could, yeah, what was the deal with those? Yeah, so, so, that, so that's not a, like, we, we did, and there's like, nothing sort of diagnostic came out of that. But we did, where we did see a uh, signal is with some penguin work. So we actually did some penguin work uh, with penguins at a zoo. And that's another thing I like about penguins is you can find them at zoos. So you can actually do, you know, controlled feeding experiments on large charismatic megafauna. And so uh, we, one of the things we noticed with them is that, so we, we found these t you know, differences in isotope value and how they're, you know, how they're utilizing their resources. And, and we were like, oh man, like, they were like these, they like separated. So we're like, what is this? Like, is it you know, their sex? No. Is it you know, like size? Is it timing of malt? No. And it ended up being how long it, like whether or not they uh, they fasted before they molted, and so there were you know in the wild everybody fasts for about a month before they molt because you can't jump in the water while you're you know while you're getting ready to molt, but in a zoo you can eat as much as you want, and so there were some that bucked their evolutionary trend and they're like if you're gonna give me fish I'm gonna eat, and so you can actually see that distinction in the isotope value, so you can, definitely can. In, in that snapper example, um, we were chatting about like, you know, generalist specialist. Uh, and I've, there's a whole branch about that too. But like, you know, there were, there were definitely individuals that, you know, were doing their own thing. But like as a population, you know, you sort of see specialization. But like individuals seem to kind of do whatever, you know, like there's lots of individual variation that gets recorded that you only sort of appreciate the pattern when you scale out to you know sample sizes big enough that you start to like can see some of that population dynamic we couldn't find why like there's no there's no body condition difference or no like we controlled for size on this because we didn't want that to be a, a confounding variable um, although I, I think it'd be fun to go back and then do it on a size gradient because we've done it with a single species Ehrenberg snapper um, and they do shift their diet and you can pick that up but yeah, I don't know why they do it. All right, guys, just for the sake of time, it's four o'clock. Um, so we get 